So, okay, so, so I want to talk about the Austrian philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. And, and I want to talk about him not only because he's had, he's had a, a very profound impact on my life and, and, and the very, honestly, the very way that I can look at the world. He, he really changed uh, the way that I was able to perceive and kind of articulate the world. But, but I want to talk him now because he has written extensive material on this, what I would call this false dichotomy between the objective and the subjective. And, and I want to talk about one of his notes in particular, uh, one which I've come to refer to as Wittgenstein's butterfly challenge. And in this passage, you're, you're asked to perform a quite simple exercise. And, but it, even though it's very simple and, and very quick exercise, it's, it's very deep and it really gives you a lot to chew on. And I, and I kind of want to share that passage now and actually go through some of those uh, experiences because in the passage, he, he simply asks you to, to imagine a butterfly. Imagine, imagine a butterfly exactly as it is, except imagine it ugly instead of beautiful. And I, like I said, I want you to go ahead and try this exercise. Go ahead and do it. I mean, imagine your butterfly in its exact physical appearance. And when I do this exercise, I'm usually thinking of like a monarch butterfly. So, so imagine those, those beautiful oranges and those, those beautiful blacks. Uh, kind of intermingling in a beautiful natural pattern, but simply imagine that physical picture as ugly. Imagine it ugly instead of beautiful. Now, before I go on interpreting this challenge, because that's what I want to do next, I want to say a bit about what I don't believe Wittgenstein is trying to do here, because I have had a few encounters with friends and, and colleagues that thought this challenge was some kind of rhetorical statement on, 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 our, on our kind of inherent subjectivity, on our fundamental and inescapable subjectivity. But I don't interpret this passage as a mere rhetorical statement because I believe he also expected you to try it. And if you do, if you do try to imagine that butterfly, I'm sure that you'll find that you can't do it. You can't do what Wittgenstein is asking you to do in the challenge. The only thing I, I always think about is just like zooming way in on the butterfly's face. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you could do that. Because yeah. the face is pretty gross. <laughs> but yeah, just like when you see it there with the wings and stuff, yeah. it's like, you, no, you I can't, can't. You can't do it. say it's ugly. No, no, you can't do that. That's funny about the face. I, I just, and it's got that, um, yeah, that <laughs> gem rolls. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty gross, actually. <laughs> but then it's not exactly like it is, because you're not, you're not yeah. seeing its you, face at that. Your phenomenon is different. Yeah. The idea is you have the same phenomenon in both pictures, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So let's just, uh, let's be honest. I mean, you can't imagine the butterfly in its exact physical appearance, and then simply imagine that butterfly as ugly. I mean. In order to do this, to, to, to imagine it as ugly, you, you would actually have to alter the, the material phenomena before you, you'd actually have to make it ugly, so to speak. So I think that the point is, uh, which, that I believe Wittgenstein is trying to get at, is that you can't simply change your subjective judgment, just as you can't change the objective judgment of, of three inches long uh, once you've, say, compared the, the wings of the butterfly to a ruler. So if I've interpreted this challenge correctly, then I believe that he's trying to get you to realize that your judgment, beautiful and ugly, is not some human coloring which is secondarily added on to some cold and hard and human independent substance. And that the aesthetic quality, beautiful or, or ugly, is, is actually there at rock bottom. It's, it's right there with the phenomena. And that there's actually very little difference in the phenomenal encounter with the subjective and the aesthetic and, and those objective judgments, which we usually take to be the cold, hard, objective reality. And, and the biggest difference between those properties uh, doesn't lie in the objects themselves, but, but it instead lies in the fact that we simply have tools which produce a high agreement on the measurement of length or time, for example. So beautiful, ugly, they don't fall into the objects themselves, but they, they fall into the tools that we have. That, that's, I think, the argument which is trying to happen here with Wittgenstein's challenge. And, and also, I think he's trying to get you to realize that our poor ability to maintain aesthetic judgments and also the fact that we're so easily persuaded causes us to think otherwise. It causes us to, to divide our opinions from facts and, and causes us to think that the subjective and the aesthetic qualities are merely secondary to the objective, to the concrete material ones. And 
that those states and those judgments, that they're not somehow one of the very building blocks of the world that we have together, the world that we share and disclose to each other together. And because this passage does such a good job of questioning those distinctions between objective and subjective and anesthetic, it, it's the reason why I think this statement has so much relevance today, because I do think that it's time that we seriously think about the consequence of degrading our subjective states and aesthetic judgments. Now, I think for a long time now, we, we've been experiencing something that I would call a crisis. I think we've been experiencing something of a crisis in self, a crisis in our very self. I mean, I believe that our natural position as someone who has lived in the world is, is to be a discloser of the world. I mean, we experience the world and we disclose that world to each other through and by way of our experiences. I mean, our experiences are surely the most valuable thing that we have to share with each other. And with our experiences, we, we go up to construct the very world that we have. Yet, because of an industrialization of human activity, because everything is so separated and so segregated, I think that we're experiencing something of a crisis uh, within our very position in the world as an experiencer and a, and, a, and a discloser of it. Because we're being fed things like objective facts and, and, and so much news. And we're being, we read scientific journals kind of talking about scientific theory and scientific objects which are inexperienceable. And, and we're led to believe, and for good reason, that those inexperienceable objects like those of, of quantum mechanics, for example, are the most fundamental objects of the world. And this type of relationship with the world, it, it's quite far, it's quite far removed from, from that intimate relationship which we people, humans, used to hold with the other most fundamental object of the world, say, say God, when we had that personal relationship with that very foundational being. So, for me, it feels very obvious. It's no wonder that the most common illness that we hear with within the, the whole modern era is a feeling of alienation. And sure, guys like, like Adam Smith and Karl Marx, they had wrote about the division of labor as that which alienates the modern man from life. And some of that writing is already 250 years old now. So, so alienation is not a new topic. But, but I have to believe that their prescription it was a bit myopic because the starting point, I believe, it was a bit too narrow. And the alienation of industrialization that I'm thinking of, it's not limited to factory production because our alienation must be much more deeply founded in our life because our information about the world comes from so many distant sources like news and science. We're witnessing an alienation from our most existential position as that world discloser in our very existence kind of playing the active part in disclosing the world. We're kind of stripped of our position as a world discloser. I mean, we're being so fed so much information that we're expected to blind, blindly follow, but, but we don't have an active participation in any of it. So we're, we're kind of, I would put it quite nastily, we're, we're kind of reduced to the role of a gossiper. I hear someone tell me about a scientific theory and I'm like, Okay, so you read this online, so what? Yeah. But what do you want me to do with this? Like, go gossip about it? Tell somebody else? I don't really understand. <laughs> Stop telling me about this. Well, no. <laughs> if there's some bearing, if I understand why, but if it's just information, it's just raw information. I don't, I often don't know what to do with it. I have to admit. No more facts. <laughs> now you're saying my Hashtag no more facts. <laughs> <laughs> That's the name of my YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, I, I know this is probably going to sound a bit shocking, and even when I say these words, it'll probably even sound shocking to myself, but, but honestly, this is the reason why I had sympathized with those flat earthers a few years ago. I mean, their very existence was evidence to me that, that, that once again, we were kind of overdue to rebalance the experience of the world and experiential language, as I, as I call it, over that scientific and objective factual gossip. I mean, if we think about their retort and not actually what they were trying to disclose, not the, don't think about the world that they were trying to picture, but think of their retort, think of their words. Their, their retort was always, have you experienced it? You know, have you experienced the curvature of the earth? They were, they were kind of something of an ugly consequence of, of an imbalance 
in our modern form of world disclosure. And, and that we've simply just gotten too far from, from being that person who discloses the world through our experience. We've, we've kind of gotten too far from what I call in my writing, ecstatic and authentic experiential identification, world identification, object identification, and our very own identities. Cliffhanger. I'll talk more about identities a lot later. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> more about identities later. <laughs> I hope I didn't just break your eardrums with that laugh. <laughs> no, 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 it's not. It's not. I, I, I've got, I got a good protection here.